RPS. Love from Prima Beta Sound 2022. Proudly presented by Cupra. Ladies and gentlemen, you're listening to a Radio Primavera Sound live broadcast from the Parkdale Forum in Primavera Sound second weekend, weekend two. Uh, it is not only one of the greatest intersections for modern music made on the fringes, it is also a wonderful place to meet very interesting people from all over the globe. People from as far away as Australia have flown all the way into Barcelona to perform at the festival like our next guest who may manage to bring a mood of doomed romanticism to the forum. Ladies and gentlemen, Alex Cameron. <laughs> Thank you very much for having me. What a pleasure. Nice. Thanks for being here. I, we, we have to have uh, recorded claps because they're clapping, but we don't hear it on the microphone. Okay. And, and so, yeah. There's uh, lots of people clapping just yeah. for the record. For the people listening, just so you know. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Junji, our sound technician, please. Uh, we need aplausos uh, pregrabados. Yeah. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Like in the sitcoms. Yeah. You like, just played... Um, the vine and the state, which we can all see from here, like mm. a few hours ago. So thank you for being here. I bet you're still from the adrenaline of playing. Sure. Um, and you also played um, at the city venues that the special gigs we have been doing this week at Drasmatas this Sunday. So how has been performing in Barcelona been? Uh, how how do you feel? Like, explain because we have been working and we didn't manage to go to either of the gigs. Right. Okay. Well, I mean, it's very festive. You know, and it's, I think there's an, uh, an added uh, quality of uh, excitement based on, you know, no one's been able to do this kind of thing in a, in a little while, you know, two mm. year break. So there's a sense of excitement and, uh, and freshness and there's a quality of newness to it, you know, re rediscovery. Um, touring and playing again generally has been really cool because I think the break actually... Uh, in a way kind of and it's hard to find a silver lining but I think in a way the break meant that a lot of the gatekeepers and people that were in the music business on the technical side of things production side of things had to step aside and now there's lots of new people so at venues there's more diverse range of people it's not just uh, it's such a male dominated industry and mm. you know it's it's cool to see entire production teams run by women now and uh, hopefully it, it becomes more diverse uh, because of what you know all the negative things hopefully it means that there's a new kind of people working in the business um, but I think um, ultimately the shows just feel like a, a real celebration what is Binance? Ooh. <laughs> so <laughs> it's a question. market it's an online marketplace for NFTs and cryptocurrencies. Okay, okay. So there's been a little bit of like uh, uh we'll opin there. divided <laughs> opinions on online about like yeah. Uh, I like the idea of it being like a, a, a finance uh company for bisexual people. <laughs> It, yeah, you know, it's like, I oh think you just God. made their slogan. Yeah, yeah that's <laughs> we're like finance, a, the finance. Yeah, it's like I kind of I'm I've been raised to to use you know the more traditional economy, but I'm also curious about what I'm this crypto queer. thing is. <laughs> I don't want to say that I'm just using regular banks. <laughs> I don't want to be so closed off. But it's funny when you hear these new terms of like the flat white economy, which is like all the businesses that have to do with hipster culture, or whatever. So all of a sudden it's like, oh yeah, the the yeah the bi the bisexual economy is like right. it, it's out there. Yeah, Binance. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so apart from being here, you have been touring for a while, and you have plenty of shows um, to go. How how is tour life? Are are you like? in contact with reality. I feel like if I change cities so often in such a like not short per period of time, especially in a long period of time, I would be kind of crazy. Yeah, I mean, I, I think uh, there's a, an element uh, of my personality that um, struggles with stability. So I actually quite enjoy the mania of it. <laughs> and uh, I'm my, my most mentally... Uh, fit when I'm traveling and touring and working. 
And working is great. I've worked every other job and this is the best one, so. Yeah, it sounds like a pretty good job. Yeah, it's, it's a good job. <laughs> you said mentally fit when you're traveling mm. and touring. Yeah, I feel like you can change, when you change cities, you leave a lot of your previous thoughts in that city. Yeah. And so if you're changing city every day, it's an, always an opportunity for a new, it's a great privilege to be able to travel and meet new people. And yeah. it's, a, it's a unique style of living. But maybe I could also be like a traveling salesman or like a, what else causes people to travel? Uh, sales, uh, well, tourism. Um, oh, tourism. Uh, yeah, but tourism, yeah, it's, yeah, no, it's expensive. Uh, but if you're working and you can pass. Journalism, maybe. Yeah. Journalism. But I think the music thing is kind of working for you. Yeah, I'm happy <laughs> so with the music thing. I think you should uh, stay there. Yeah, yeah. I'm but um, but the, but speaking of like the we we talk about this a lot about the mental the the delicacy of mental health for when, when you're a touring professional, not mm. just musician, technician, or whatever. Uh, what kind of rituals or things do you have apart from the joy of being on the move, as you said? Mm. But when you have those moments, maybe of solace, of loneliness, uh, even if you're with your crew, sometimes you know, do, sure. do you have do you have things that you can go to to feel better if you're in some part of the world which isn't uh, home? Well, so, something that helped was that I I stopped uh, drinking before shows. That was like a big step, I think. You know, because early on in 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 your career as a musician, you're often like. The fees aren't so hot, but they just sort of buddy you up with alcohol to sort of make it feel like it's a party. And it is a party, mm. you know, but um, I stopped drinking before shows because I just wanted to like start start treating it like a job. And and then after work, you have a little bit of a, a drink and have a good time. But there's another thing, like when you play shows, um, often... I think it's misconstrued as like the work is what happens on stage. Mm. Actually, the work is traveling and being on a plane for eight hours and being on a bus for 12 hours and, and being living in a van for a month. That's the work. And when you're on stage, that's just like the sugar on top. The, the job is being capable and able to travel and like, uh, you know, develop uh, a tolerance for that lifestyle. That's actually what you're being paid for, you know, because anyone, I mean, who wants to be a musician would, would love to do what, what I just did on stage. That's a, a that's the goal. Mm. But uh, the work is, is the, all the cogs and the way that it, the production of it and the logistics, that's the, the mechanism that allows that to happen is what I, what I call the job. Because there's also that part of like people have paid a ticket to see you and you have to be on point every time the show starts. Right. And, you know, we, we've, we've seen so many cases of rock and roll, the rock and roll lifestyle where you get to the next date and you're like hungover. Everyone manages to bring the game mm. as soon as lights are up. But sometimes after a 50 night tour, it can be hard. Yeah, I've had some times on stage where I've felt like really nauseous. My biggest fear is that like I, I don't know why I, I wonder, I wonder like I feel like something awful is going to happen. Like my, mm. I'm going to all of a sudden be naked or I'm going to like mm. vomit on stage or something. Like I would do something deeply private, but in front of everybody. That's like the nightmare. But then I played this show in um, in Brussels and I was wearing a, a jumpsuit. Mm. And so to go to the bathroom, I had to take it all off. And I was, you know, naked in the bathroom. And uh, someone like busted into the door and like 30 people in line for the toilet saw me on the <laughs> naked right five minutes before the show started. And so then I experienced that and I was like, okay, I just don't really have anything else to be scared of now. It's not even that bad. So. Yeah, it's not that bad. <laughs> I mean, I could tell who had seen me naked in the crowd. I could see it in their faces. <laughs> and I wanted to talk, you, uh, to talk to you about your new album, obviously, um, it's part of the reason you're touring, mm. um, Oxy <laughs> Music. And you have said, well, many times it's inspired by the book Cherry by Nico Walker. Mm -hmm. um, how did that go? Like you finished the book and you loved it so much. You were like, I'm going to write an album. Or you were writing the album and you were even more inspired by mm. the book you just read. No, I think it happens like I, I read the book. And then I started writing songs and maybe like a year later realized that the book had given me access to my own thoughts. I mean, I think the way inspiration works for me and maybe, maybe for other people is that you kind of have to reflect on what you've done and why you did it artistically. 
Um, and Nico is such a brilliant writer. Um, and he just wrote about the opioid crisis in such a frank and uh, honest way. And and I think I, it's such a the the problem. I think right now one of the biggest problems is is there's either you're either a good person or you're a bad person, mm. and and who you are is in your social media bio, and there's no nuance, and there's no we struggle to relate with people, even if if they disagree with us, then they're evil, you know. And um, I, I'm a progressive person, and I, I like to think of. I like to think that progress is peaceful and uh, holding on to tradition and trying to go backwards is actually a vi- requires violence. Um, so I just like I just like to understand things. I think understanding is progress. So I mean, I, the idea of writing an album about the opioid crisis was just so I could get a grip on what was happening, you know, to myself and the people around me via via that problem. I also like to talk about things that people aren't comfortable talking about. That's something I like to do, yeah. typically even in conversation. <laughs> I, that's what another of the things I wanted to talk to you about. It's like the the things you sing in, in, in your songs, it's not like the typical topics you would think of. Yes, we have heard songs before and, and they're kind of all the same, but you've talked about being a step, that becoming a step, that sex and family life, addiction and, and whatever you else you have sung about. Have you ever had like this moment of being kind of scared of talking about a certain topic that maybe because you are also fictionalized a lot of your songs mm. that people tell you, oh, you're mm, not representing or singing about this properly or whatever, especially because it's a niche topic. Right, yeah, like the idea that I might be like a tourist or like mm-hmm. not, not no, because most of the songs are, are via uh, a written in conversation. Mm. I, most of my lyrics come from talking to people and either about myself or them. So they're deeply personal. I just, just I can spin it in a fictional way. It doesn't mean that it's not personal. I learn more about life from fiction than I do from like, you know, history books. Um, and yeah, I mean, I'm not really, all, all of what I really need to say is in the songs. If you want to have a conversation with me beyond what the song means, I mean, I, that's going to be, I'm, I'm more than happy to talk about it, you know, I, and I'm more than happy to deal with, with reviews, bad reviews, good reviews. It doesn't stress me out. What I, I, I know what I'm doing, you know. I, I'm not at all uh, worried about, I think I think artists like to pretend that like it's uh, freedom of speech is important and 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 like woke PC culture is going to stop us from making art. But it's like really, if you're a good person, you know, by your yeah. own standards and you treat people well, you shouldn't be worried about. It sounds to me more like they're worried about their own personal behavior rather than their art. Mm. Well, speaking of which. Uh, we we talk about this a lot, and and as music fans, we're also fans of the personas that a lot of artists like yourself create. Mm. Uh, I'm particularly uh, uh, interested in the persona of the failed musician vibe that you had going mm. uh, uh, a few in in, in, a, in one of the uh, another one of your eras in the shark uh, jumping the shark phase. Mm-hmm. Um, what was it that? I know what I love about that figure, no, of the decadence, you know, of playing some toilet, you know, when you when you've uh, when you're over, I don't know, like in Las Vegas, uh, that kind of uh, right. gloomy image. What was it that you like about that? That you thought, wow, this can work for me to to create a whole body of work. I think, like the the denial, is is really uh, palpable, and there's a lot that branches out emotionally from the concept of denial. I think uh, what fascinates me about people generally is that we don't want change typically in, in, a, in, like a, in our private lives and, and, and in, in, in society, we struggle with change typically. And, and I, I think a lot of what I see as being a fundamental challenge to existence is this sort of like instinctual uh, repulsion to change. And and so I, I think it was just a really strong metaphor for like my own fears and for what I was seeing as being 
the reason why we, people were mistreating each other generally. So, I mean, it also just looks good and feels good. I really, I really like the aesthetic of a, of like a, a suit, you know, either mm. on on anybody, not just on men. Mm. And, I, and I also uh, like, you know, artistically, I like the the my favorite venues that I've played on Earth tend to be older. Even if they're empty, they're still fun to play. Yeah. Um, and I was, it actually made sense starting out on my first record to make a record about a failed musician because I knew my first shows were going to be empty with no one there. So it made sense narratively to be like, if no one's here, I may as well act like someone who w thinks people should be here. Yeah. It added to this element of people could go, even if there were only 30 people at a show, they could go away being like, wait, was that actually someone who we should have known about. It was sort of just these question yeah. marks. I like people to leave a show with questions, you know? Yeah. That's uh, so clever. Well, because it's also, because some of your first gigs were at David Lynch's club Silencio in Paris, and mm -hmm. you have a bit of a back, background in working with uh, contemporary art, right? And that kind of right. world. Yeah, yeah. And creating context for a work mm -hmm. of art is so important. And I noticed that from art, musical art, musicians who, who have a bit of an art school background or, or are familiar with the way Uh, the art world contextualizes works of right. art and happenings, right? Uh, yeah, I was really excited to play at that club specifically because they have this like mechanized red curtain uh, and you, uh, you, I would go on stage and stand there with the microphone and then the curtain like sort of opens like this and it's like yeah. silent and it was just, there's just such a, it just is already telling a story before I even have to make even one gesture or sing a, a word, you know? Um, Yeah, and I also, but in Paris, I also played in like a lot of uh, like old like Turkish bars. And mm. I was just saying yes to everything and asking. Actually, I was playing for free a lot of the time. Um, and then like, you know, just so that I could get on bills. That's how I did it. I, I made a fake manager uh, whose name was Kay. Ah, I feel bad saying it was fake because there's some people that <laughs> some think, people it's, think that it's not as bad as the JT Leroy case, but continue. It, 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 uh, I had an email address and I would send it to promoters and be like, I'm representing this artist. He's yeah. really special and he'll work for free. He just wants to be on bills. And I actually got some work doing that. They didn't let me work for free. They paid. But I think it was that sense of desperation that like encouraged yeah. them to book me. Yeah, it, it's it's cruel, but it's true. It's like so it 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 sounds desperate if you, the artist, are. Oh, can you put me on your bill? Whereas if you have, if you create a fake, yeah, 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 yeah. It's it's quite standard practice. I, I've done it. So from <laughs> right, yeah, yeah. It's not so out. It's not so out of line. But you know, um, I think I I would like to think beyond the whole world I was trying to create artistically. I, the songs do the talking. I knew the songs were good. I knew I liked the songs by my own standards. Mm. So it was just a matter of time uh, displaying willingness to work that would, the quality of the songs and my willingness to work. My uncle always said that you got to balance your ambition with your work ethic. So if you can understand what your actual work ethic is and and balance it with what you want out of life, you got to find the mix because when you have this huge ambition but no work ethic mm. or good work ethic and no ambition, that imbalance can create, you know, uh, challenges mentally in life, you know, lead to depression and anxiety. So what, what he gave me that advice when I was younger and I kind of, I'm still grappling with it. Like what do, what do I want to do and, and what am I capable of doing? And then what do I want to achieve? And that balance is important for like finding, I don't know. What, uh, yeah, that's uh, actually really good advice. I'm, I'm just thinking now like- Yeah, yeah I was quite kind of blown away. He's like a <laughs> farmer from Queensland. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, then we know who to talk to if we want great yeah. advice. I have one last question because we're told we have to go already. Mm -hmm. But I think, well, um, we've seen we're, uh, right now talking and listening to your music, creating characters, it, it comes natural to you. Is it possible that there exists like an Alex Cameron multiverse of madness of your <laughs> characters and they exist and they talk to each other like from album to album? Maybe they know each other and maybe... Uh, I like the idea of... of um, I really like the idea of doing a sequel to a, a song. <laughs> like I'd do like a Candy Made 2. Yeah. 
I don't know why people don't do sequels. Then like I would just like, it will be the same them. chords, yeah. but new lyrics. Or like, you know, I, need to I want know to do what sequels. To I think sequels in music need to be a thing. I totally agree. And prequels. <laughs> yeah, the, the multiverse. Spin-offs. Um, of madness, I really need it. I yeah. really need <laughs> all of them to meet and all of them yeah. to, to talk to each all other. All right, that's, that's <laughs> what I'll do next. <laughs> Thank you for coming. Thank you for being with us here. Thanks um, for having me. It's been a pleasure yeah, talking to really you. Yeah, it's really nice. You have I, very beautiful hands, Alex, I have to say. <laughs> Someone told me my nail beds were really nice. Yep. <laughs> Look, look, I can't I, stop I, looking. I'm yeah. sorry, I'm taking pictures without asking, but it's because the lighting <laughs> right now, the nails, the ring, it's it's really beautiful. Huh. Thank you so much, Alex. I have, a, I have a, this thumb, I have like hitchhiker's thumb. Hey! hey! Yep. Oh my oh, god, god. Yeah. I'm sorry for the ones listening, but we're tw mm, deformed people. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. We have double jointed yeah. thumbs. Whoa! I have a it triple. Then. Oh. I didn't even know. Maybe we're not that special. That's a triple. <laughs> yeah, guys, thanks for coming from three to four. Thanks for being humans. here, everybody. <laughs> and that was really fun. I hope you. we get to hang out. <laughs> Thank you, Alex. RPS. Love. From Premier Better Sound 2022. Proudly presented by Cupra.